A very good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to welcome you all for this very special uh, session on capacity building. My name is Gabriel Achaye, and I'm speaking to you uh, from the Secretariat of the East Africa Law Society in Arusha, Tanzania, uh, Karibuni. Uh, it's good to have you, bienvenue. Uh, today's topic of discussion is uh, on conquering abuse and practical tips for overcoming bullying and sexual harassment in the workplace. Uh, so I find this topic quite uh, relevant for most of us who are young in the legal practice space. Uh, many of us have, uh, in one way or another, interfaced with bullying and sexual harassment. And it, it's indeed reported to be one of the most common forms of abuse that young lawyers face in their early years of practice. And uh, this continues even uh, throughout their mid years of practice with seniors coming in. Uh, sometimes uh, you know how the profession can be. Yeah, so this particular session is aimed at uh, raising awareness about this, but also to uh, give you practical tips how you can overcome uh, uh, bullying and sexual harassment in your workplace in order to achieve uh, and, 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 and maximize uh, your effort uh, in your workspace and also uh, accomplish your goals. So this afternoon, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have a very distinguished uh, panel of, uh, of, 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 of experts. Uh, these are both from academia, private practice, and uh, civil society. So I know it's going to be a very uh, insightful session for us, and we look forward to a very uh, uh, engaging session with you, our, our esteemed participants. Our moderator for the day uh, shall be Ms. Elizabeth Musicali. Ms. Elizabeth Musicali is a lecturer of law and an advocate of the High Court of Kenya. Uh, she's a lecturer at the Faculty of Law, Catholic University of Eastern Africa. She's also a partner at Dr. Musicali Advocates, LLP, and uh, we are honored to have her serve as our chairperson for our corporate law committee, and also, she's also a member of the Young Lawyers Committee. And uh, Ms. Musicali will be uh, taking us through the session this afternoon. She will introduce the panelists. I call upon all of you to engage, uh, participate fully. Uh, and uh, we are streaming live on uh, Facebook and uh, we're also live on Twitter. So get tweeting and uh, invite colleagues who are not yet on the call to come and join us. Otherwise, from the Secretariat, we are happy to have you. And over to you, Ms. Musicali, you can take this on now. Right. Thank you very much for that introduction. And again, welcome everyone to today's session. We are having a very important discussion about um, the issue of sexual harassment and uh, bullying in the workplace. And with us today, we have three uh, panelists from across East Africa. I'll uh, introduce them in no particular order <laughs> whatsoever. Um, but we first have uh, Ms. Immaculate Were, who's an advocate of the High Court of Kenya and also a certified professional mediator and arbitrator. And she is a keen litigator uh, with a particular interest in public interest litigation. Uh, again, she's also won awards for, um, with, with the Katiba Institute and is committed to the rights of women. Karibu, uh, Ms. Immaculate. We also have Mr. Herbert Walusimbi who is um, from um, our neighboring country, Uganda. He's the deputy director of the Law Development Center, Lira Campus. And uh, he's also a holder of um, a degree in law, an LLB and um, an LLM in law. And finally, we have um, Miss we have with us Ms. Tusekile Asajile from um, the Ch Tanganyika Law Society. She's a, a mental health specialist and also has a specialism in human rights law. She also holds an LLB and LLM in human rights from Tumain University and an MSc in mental health, L ethics and law from the King's College in London. 
Again, she's also published uh, in the um, Tuma Law Review on sexual harassment in the public sphere, and um, has uh, is a founder of Akilihu Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization seeking to create awareness on mental health and the importance of personal well-being for enhanced uh, productivity and success. So, I'd like to introduce to to welcome all our panelists for today and get right into um, the topic. So basically what we're going to do is that we're going to do a brief overview of what sexual harassment is in the workplace and hear about our different experiences and uh, codes from um, the region. And then I will get into how we can practically conquer or deal with this particular um, um, problem with our jurisdiction. But if you have any questions, kindly please keep asking them in the comment, um, in the question and answer area, and we'll deal with that after the panel discussion. So welcome all our um, panelists. So our first question, which I will uh, uh, address directly to Mr. Uh, Haman is, what is workplace bullying and sexual harassment and how is it defined in your jurisdiction? Did you mean Hubbard? Sorry, Mr. Hubbard, I'm so sorry about that. Yes. So Mr. Uh, Wilson. So, sorry, it's okay, it's okay. Um, maybe for clarifying to the, the, the listeners before I proceed to respond to your question, um, the assistant director and not the uh, deputy director. Uh, going forward to respond to your question, uh, going forward to respond to your question, uh, sexual harassment and bullying are quite uh, interesting topics to, to, to really speak to because devices really affect uh, the quality of work delivered by employees. They have a uh, Overlasting uh, psychological impact on the well-being uh, of, of lawyers, young lawyers, and not only young lawyers uh, across the spaces in East Africa, but also other individuals who are not lawyers. Before I speak about uh, sexual harassment, I need to really uh, speak to uh, its Yami's sister, uh, bullying. Bullying is a very interesting aspect that opens up the window for sexual harassment. Bullying simply means a conduct uh, that seeks to intimidate, coerce someone perceived to be in a vulnerable position. And, uh, and that is well pronounced where you have employer-employee relations where the power play is not even. In name employment law, it simply means uh, that unwanted behavior from a person or group that is either offensive, uh, malicious, or insulting. Now, when you have a boss who conducts themselves in a way that is uh, unwanted, it's offensive and malicious, and the intention is for sexual favors, that is why you have these uh, linkages between bullying and sexual uh, harassment. In Uganda, uh, we have uh, a quite comprehensive uh, principal legislation governing uh, uh, employment and also uh, sexual harassment. We have the Employment Act, uh, Acting Number no. Six of 2006, under which we have the employment in bracket sexual harassment across uh, bracket regulations of 2012. When you look at uh, those two pieces of legislation, the principal and subsidy legislation, the conclusion you can make of what uh, constitutes sexual harassment is that uh, these are unwelcome sexual advances, requests for sexual favors and other verbal or physical, uh, physical conduct of a sexual nature. When, for example, one, submission to such conduct is made either explicitly or implicitly a term or condition of an individual's employment. Two, submission or rejection of such conduct by an individual is used as a basis for employment decisions affecting such an individual. And finally, when such conduct has the purpose or effect of unreasonably interfering with individual's work performance or creating 
an intimidating, hostile, or offensive working environment for the employees so affected. So you can clearly see the, the linkage between bullying and sexual harassment. It manifests in a number of, of aspects. I don't think we can have a conclusive list, but to mention a few for the benefit of our listeners, uh, it can constitute actual attempted rape or sexual assault, unwanted uh, pressure for sexual favors, unwanted deliberate touching, leaning over, cornering, pinching, unwanted sexual looks or gestures, unwanted letters, WhatsApp, telephone calls, sharing sexual materials. You, you go, you walk into your, your chambers and you find a CD sent to you by a senior partner. Turning it on your, on your laptop, you're seeing a brew movie and you're wondering what is the intention of this senior partner in sending this video. That constitutes sexual harassment. You have unwanted pressure, uh, pressure for, for debts. You have a lady who keeps on demanding for debt from this young lawyer with menaces. Unwanted sexual teasing, jokes or remarks or questions during interviews. When the chairperson of an interview that is an interview committee uh, where you seek to be employed is asking questions and those questions are suggesting of sexual pressures for you to be able to be appointed. Uh, unwanted sexual teasing, jokes, remarks, questions, referring to an adult as a girl, hunk, doll, babe, or honey, whistling at someone, the, what you call cut calls, sexual comments, standing work discussion to sexual topics, sexual in windows and stories. The list is really uh, so extensive. Uh, Liz, I don't know whether I've been able to uh, comprehensively respond to, to your question. Yes, yes, you have. Thank you very much for that. I'll just direct the same to um, Ms. Immaculate and Ms. Tusekile, but in the sense that uh, we want to sort of also hear about um, the whether you already have a body of the law that deals with um, this in your country as well. Thank you very much, Habat, for that. And I'd also like to request the panelists to all keep uh, um, your videos on um, throughout. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you for, for the question that you've asked. Um, and I think I'll just pick it up from where Habat has left. And um, I will say in Kenya as well, we have a, a body of laws that deals with sexual harassment. Um, first of all, we have the Sexual Offenses Act, where someone can get some reprieve in the event that um, the act committed by an employer meet the, the threshold that is um, set out under the act. Um, we also have the Employment Act as well, yeah, which um, has set out what sexual harassment in the context of employment amounts to. And uh, we also have case law, which I think uh, is recognized in Kenya as a source of law. So you may find um, previous cases where someone has sued an employer for sexual harassment. Um, yes, so apart from that, um, for, for what is specific to lawyers, we have um, the LSK Code of Conduct and Ethics, which also um, touches on sexual harassment to some extent. You can check that in, that, that will be subject 12. So then um, you find that there's a quite um, a good idea within the legal framework of what uh, sexual harassment is. However, I think the other issue is now with bullying. Um, I think bullying, I don't think it has been clearly set out in law what amounts to bullying. Maybe the end result of it, which may be um, bodily harm and other, other outcomes have, have been prescribed in law. For example, you'll find that the penal code, you know, touches on certain aspects. Uh, we have issues like defamation, the laws around defamation, but bullying in itself, um, I think that is a bit uh, unclear within the Kenyan legal framework. So. Uh, back to the moderator. I don't know if that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Pick up from there. Yes, um, Ms. Chisikila. Hi, um, thank you. Yeah, I, uh, I, we don't have much of a difference from what Immaculate and uh, Mr. Hubbard has said. However, uh, 
unfortunately for us, uh, bullying is no is not in the law. Like we don't have any law that defines what is bullying, how is it criminalized. So, like Immaculate said, only if it escalates to say physical assault, then you can use the penal code. But otherwise, there is no definition of bullying and what it constitutes. But we do have um, laws that criminalize sexual harassment. So we have the penal code. And then we have the uh, Code of Ethics and Conduct for Public Servants, and then the uh, Prevention and Corruption, uh, Prevention of and Combating of Corruption Act. Uh, but one of the things that um, most of these uh, laws is missing. So when you talk about sexual harassment, you have two main types of sexual harassment. So the first one is a quid pro quo harassment, where it's more of a dynamic power. You have one in management and another one in lower level asking for maybe favors or um, uh, in, um, those examples that uh, Mr. Hubbard clearly gave in the beginning. But then you have another form that is called hostile working environment in which most uh, mostly happens between co-workers. So if you look at uh, my uh, current jurisdiction, if you look at the laws, they mainly focus on the first aspect of harassment. So it becomes very difficult to criminalize the second aspect, or rather to find a, a redress when that uh, when that happens, when if it is your coworker that is now uh, subjecting you to harassment. Um, yeah, so that's our current situation. Right, thank you very much. Now that we all understand what uh, sexual harassment is and the scope um, which is covered in our different jurisdictions, I feel that uh, we also need to talk about what the consequences of the same are in our jurisdictions before we get into how now um, these codes or these um, uh, laws can be enforced in the workplace, right? So what are the consequences, for example, if a person has been accused of um, sexual harassment or bullying in the workplace with the already existing codes, what is the, um, what is the available um, consequence? Um, we can probably start with Mr. Aluf Simbi, then we'll go back to Immaculate and finish off with Ms. Tusekile. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth, and I'd like to thank the colleagues for their insights. As, as far as the jurisdictions are concerned, uh, in Uganda, when you look at uh, the regulations that I mentioned earlier, that is the Employment uh, Sexual Harassment Regulations of 2012, uh, regulation number 18, to be precise, uh, creates offenses uh, where, where, where you, 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 you have um, a person found to have uh, been involved in sexual harassment, uh, is said to commit an offense and is liable on conviction to a fine not exceeding six current points or imprisonment not exceeding three months or both. The flip side of this is that um, the, the sentence really looks to be so, so light when you look at uh, the lipo effects of sexual harassment to the victim. However, I believe that is a, a step in the right direction as far as Uganda is concerned. We can still do more. I, I don't really think that are current points which equate around, uh, uh, let me see what the regulations equate a current point into. That's around uh, 60,000 is really something you can, you, you can really uh, say is a, a, a sufficient sentence to deter uh, prospective uh, uh, offenders or even to, to punish the, the, the offender. Uh, other consequences not covered within the regulation may include termination from employment by that particular employer. The flip side of that is that what if the employer is the, the, the person harassing the junior uh, employee, which happens across the spectrum. So th that is really what we have under our, un, under our law. I don't know whether my colleagues uh, in Kenya or Tanzania have more tight or stringent uh, uh, safety needs uh, to, to ensure that the vices are really combated. Uh, I hope to listen from them and maybe pick lessons for robbing for further deterrent sentences back here home in Uganda. Liz, back to you. Right, yes, thank you, Mr. Lucindi. Yes, maybe you can hear from Kenya. Um, 
uh, what are the what are the consequences for sexual harassment and bullying in the workplace? Uh, Miss Immaculate, and then we'll finish off with Mr. Sekile. Okay, thank you. So I, I think first of all, um, we have to appreciate that anyone who is subjected to sexual harassment or bullying, they're probably in a more vulnerable position than the person who is doing the bullying or the harassment. So uh, unfortunately, a lot of times uh, bullies or sexual harassers will get away with it. However, where the victims are you know, confident enough or brave enough to follow the channels, um, I think we have one, the criminal law system where again, you can go ahead and rely on the Sexual Offenses Act and the offenses that are described uh, therein and go to the police and probably follow up um, through that channel. Um, I would say number two, we have courts. So maybe you find a situation where someone was dismissed um, after, after they were sexually harassed or such, such like outcomes, then you can approach a court and then you can have um, remedies under the Employment Act, which of course may include um, damages or any other declaration that a court will make. But then the third one is, um, I have seen from practice, um, for example, let's say someone, let's say a pupil or a very young advocate, you may also ap approach the remedies available uh, within the advocates um, section, like for example, the advocates disciplinary tribunal, or you can go to the Law Society of Kenya so that you have bodies that are specifically made for advocates that will be, you may be willing to, to take up your matter. Yes, that's how I would address that question. Okay, um, so we're not very different from the rest of the jurisdictions. So uh, you, you get redressed through criminal law. And uh, well, unfortunately, if you use the penal code, the fine is only 200,000 shillings which is around $80. So you can see already that there's a problem there, but the judge uh, or the magistrate has an option of uh, five years of imprisonment. But if you also use like, uh, if you use the prevention and conversion of corruption, which is also again in the criminal system. And why I'm emphasizing on the criminal system is because of the standard of proof, which you all know is way too high in cases like sexual harassment. So if you use that as well, the maximum penalty is five years of imprisonment or five million shillings, which um, like I, in my opinion, is still not very, uh, it's not enough, uh, like Herbert said, based on the effects of what a person goes through when they face sexual harassment. Uh, and Immaculate, uh, thank you for the advocate committee. That's actually a good point where we most of the times miss. I think it's a very, especially for advocates, it's one of the uh, best remedies to use the Advocate Disciplinary Committee. Yes, so um, now we already have a good um, understanding and overview of the legislation and um, of the, the consequences of the vice, but now we need the practical tips as to how to deal with this in the workplace. So um, my question um, with regards to this will be, what strategies do you suggest that workplaces can put in place to address issues of bias and um, to improve inclusion in order to prevent harassment? And also how can um, victims, for example, uh, or, or what strategies can be put in place so that victims can be able to report cases of bullying and sexual harassment without actually now thereafter uh, facing um, retaliation uh, or discrimination as a result of the same? can start with uh, Mr. Lucindi. Okay, uh, thank you once again. I think the first solution lies with the, with the victim. Know your worth. And I repeat it, please know your, your worth. You have not been employed as in-house counsel in that company because of how you look. It's about your brain. That has earned you a spot in that company. You're not in that law firm because of um, you, your body no it's not about your face it's about your brain so be firm be firm and say no some of those are uh, uh, advances can die in infancy don't give signs of uh, 
weakness. Don't show them that you a simple prey. And I know attorneys. Be outspoken. We, we are trained for years to speak. Speak out. But you can't speak out if you lack self-esteem, if you don't know your work in that workspace. I think that is very important. Someone comes, uh, pinches you, your butt, you look on smiling. Some people can smile, not because they really want what is being done to them. I think we have all heard about uh, what happened when Spain Women's World Cup was celebrating their victory over England, how the, the president kissed Rubiales without her consent and because she smiled, and they were laughing about it in the in the team bus en route to airport. The gentleman thought it was okay; she had consented. So you you need to speak and conduct what you feel. I think that is very important. It doesn't matter whether you're a lady, whether you're a gentleman. You don't like this advance. You don't like it. There's no a thin line between advances that will be accepted and advances that will be that will be denied. If you don't like this gentleman and what he's doing, let him know. And the same is true for the, 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 the young uh, gentleman. Ensure that you don't survive in a work environment that is devoid of a, a policy against and sexual harassment. In Uganda, when you look at uh, the, sec the Employment Sexual Harassment Regulations of 2012, they enjoin every employer having uh, 25 employees and above to have a policy. One thing I don't like about that regulation is that now the numbers determine who can have a policy. It should be any person employing anyone, it should have a policy against uh, unsexual harassment, but we don't have it. And uh, raising the ceiling to 25, I think now leaves a lot of, 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 of room for people employing five and seven. And that is what law firms, by the way, do. It's rare to find a law firm that has uh, 20, 25 attorneys. It must be really a big law firm. And most uh, farms across East Africa are small farms, 10 attorneys, nine, 15. So the numbers there raise a concern, but where are you that many? You're in the company as in house council. You, you have more than 20 employees. There's no reason why you work in an environment that doesn't have a popularized and sexual harassment policy. Let people know the complaint procedure. Where do I go? How do I lodge my complaint? Actually, lawyers should be uh, the mouthpieces of some of these movements in the employment spaces. Number three, report. Please report. No amount of money is worth the emotional distress you go through by having this man you don't like touch you every single day, sending you videos calling you at night. Some of them even end up breaking uh, families. Report. The chains are there for reporting. There are mechanisms you can take if, uh, the, for example, in Uganda, we have a sexual, every employee having more than 25 employees supposed to have a, a sexual harassment committee, which can, which should, which is ideal in joint to receive complaints. If, the committee is reluctant because the topmost boss is involved. We have another window of complaining to the labor officers of the different districts for that, for Uganda, as far as Uganda is concerned. And I'm sure uh, Sekiri and I uh, will agree with me that Kenya and Tanzania maybe have similar avenues. Report. And because you can't be fired for bringing out something that is bad under the law, you can challenge. Uh, termination because of your complaints in courts of law, and you can be compensated for that wrongful termination. You, there's no reason why you should fear and live in such an, an environment because you fear reporting. And the last shot I'll really throw in, I, I know people don't uh, like talking about how you, you portray yourself from the way you dress to the way you speak, but it matters. We have uh, uh, men who are natural predators, okay? You put on a, a short skirt, it is comfortable, you, you look beautiful, it's, it's about you, it should ideally be about you. 
but haven't you put yourself in an in a situation where this predator is going to disturb you haven't you put yourself in a situation where you have these constant advances where this gentleman is going to keep on coming Telling yeah, he likes you having this short skirt on. I'm not trying to micromanage attires. We've ever had such a regulation, such a regulation in Uganda during the many time. But I'm saying, look like a lawyer in your workspace. Look smart, but responsibly. Uh, Liz, back to you. For now, that is all I can say. I know my colleagues have so much they can offer to enrich uh, this discussion. Yes, thank you very much. And thank you for pointing out that uh, sexual harassment and bullying does happen to both men and women in the workplace. Um, we've seen the figures before, but now before I belabor the point, let's just get straight into it. The same um, discussion, but probably I want to hear the reactions from Mr. Sekile and Immaculate on the same and as well more on um, on uh, how is it that, or any practical tips that anyone can employ in cases where you actually do report? Because yes, we do have these um, reporting mechanisms in many workplaces, but what happens if you report and now afterwards you face a lot of bias? How do you deal with that as an employee? Okay. Um, I think uh, what I would say is, first of all, be just to, but just the point of her, but without victim blaming, I would say for me personally, what I wish I would have done having been in a similar situation is one, I wish I had spoken up early. Yeah, because I think one thing you'll realize, especially an issue like sexual harassment, it grows. The, uh, a harasser will keep testing you to see how far you will go. One day it will be a comment. The next date will be physical touch. The next date will be something else. So I would say uh, from a personal point of view, speak up very early, right? So um, the other thing I would say is, I think workplaces have the larger responsibility here. Yeah? We can't um, keep saying you, you as an employee, you do this to protect yourself from harassment. Why don't you have a, a, a workplace that is devoid of harassers or, or people who bully so i would say for me the most important thing is who is enforcing this policy that you have of sexual harassment that is an important question because from personal experience what happens is um you go to hr hr is like ah this case is so big just take it to the partner you go to the partner the partner is like hey, i don't think this is my responsibility go to the senior partner go to the senior partner they're like um, I only do cases. I don't think this is part of my mandate. Now, what you do, go to the founder. So then you find you you find that your problem gets lost in there, in 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 being sent from left, right, center. And sometimes you remember this time you 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 in emotional turmoil. So how do you go up that chain with all that? So knowing who exactly is supposed to enforce the the sexual code of conduct is very important. The other thing I would say is um. Maybe a complaint uh, mechanism in place, so, such that you find that you're going to someone and telling them this is happening to, to me, and then they're telling you, no, don't make your complaint oral, make it written, or it's written, and now they're telling you, come and explain. I mean, you can't subject um, a victim to more trauma of having to do oral descriptions, written descriptions, and all that. Yes, so I think that's the other thing, um, and as well as, yeah, just a code of conduct. But I have to mention something that I think a lot of people may not be willing to mention. Sometimes the solution is to leave that workplace, right? So we, we want to avoid that solution. And remember, you're a victim, and you, you're being subjected to even more emotional turmoil. And sometimes your employers may not be willing to change. And number two, um, we've all been in this justice system. We all know things may not go smoothly. You'll do your complaint, there's a sexual harassment form, there's what, still no justice. And I think um, as a matter of last resort, depending on your personal circumstances, you may also want to um, try other avenues of employment. Yes, but again, just as I end it, I have to appreciate the difficult circumstance. It is to find yourself in an environment where you're being bullied or you're being sexually harassed. I think um, that's what I would say. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think, um, first, 
there is no one that deserves to be sexually harassed, uh, irrespective of how they look or anything they have, when nobody deserves that. Um, so I um, just, just wanted to put that out. But then again, with regards to retaliation, it all begins, um, like Immaculate said, it all begins with the systems that are in place. So most of the times retaliation occurs because we don't have proper complaint uh, mechanisms and procedures that, that are just clear, that you know if this happens, first you know if this has happened, this constitutes harassment. So because this has happened, I need to go here. And if I go here, I'll get one, two, three. And then after this, then this happens and this happens. And like, you know, that the process is clear. But most of the times, if, if, if even like here, ask how many uh, people working in their firms have a clear code of conduct that has clear complaint procedures and redress mechanisms. I don't think maybe some do, but most of us don't, especially for law firms. So we, we already have a problem there. And now uh, you're likely to face retaliation because now you might go and report to a person who is probably a friend to the abuser. Um, and then now you're like, it's, it's a vicious cycle if you don't have clear mechanisms from the onset. But if we did have like way uh, in the beginning, here you go, this happens, after this happens, here you go. And then another biggest thing is also the anonymity of the person, like just having this process being very confidential because that's the, the biggest challenge in, our, uh, in, 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 in uh, prosecuting or taking, um, or if going through complaint procedures for harassment. It's just who is taking this? My biggest problem is most of the times this is left to the HR. And then the HR has all so many other things to do. So like, it's like one of these things that is like, okay, this is your duty, you're the HR, you figure that out. And then the HR does not know really how to go about it. And then in the end of the day, this thing gets into the wrong hands and then somebody faces retaliation because there was uh, negligence from the beginning. But then also, um, Immaculate talks about like just the emotional uh, toll you go through. Um, I don't, I've, I've, I've gone through sexual harassment and so I know the emotional trauma you go through it, you go through it, the day-to-day the, the, the -day going into the office seeing your harasser in front of you, them continuing to harass you and you can't, like it's just, this, it's a long process. So as, as a workplace, it also is very important to ensure that if the, if the, the person going through this process also gets psychological care so that they can be able to go through the process. Most of the times people start the process and then drop in the middle because it's just too much to take in for a person and there's no place where they can also go and get help. So I think for me, that's the practical thing that as a workplace you should do. Just go back and check at your policies and see, uh, are my policies, you know, um, protecting the victims. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, for our listeners, uh, I'd also like to invite you again to keep um, writing your comments in the chat box and also to use the question and answer box for your questions, which we'll deal with um, once we are done with this bit. Um, now, um, again, we're talking about sexual harassment in the workplace and bullying. How about in scenarios where um, the bullying or sexual harassment is not really internal, but maybe uh, we are advocates, you're facing harassment or bullying from uh, opposing counsel or even clients who are coming to the workplace, but you have to sort of still work with this client because probably of the amount of money they're bringing to the firm um, or whatever the case is. Maybe just briefly one minute each, what practical tips do you think uh, we can employ in, in our own personal lives, yeah? Without going directly to the mechanisms in the firm um, uh, to deal with that. Maybe we can start with Mr. Walusimbi and then again in the same format. Uh, our listeners, once again, I think, like I said earlier, the first solution lies with the victim or the intended victim. Just say no, stand your ground. There's nothing as powerful as an empowered being. If I don't want something, I'll look at you right in the eyes and tell you, I'm working for you because I believe in your case. I'm going to under it its logical conclusion, but that is how far we go. 
I can't have a sexual relationship with you. I don't like you making these passes at me. I don't like these comments. Please stop. I either keep on handling your brief or I withdraw. It should be as simple as that. I know that the economic uh, benefits attend and some instructions cannot really be left alone, but sometimes it is not worth it. You must know your worth. What do you want? If you value yourself more than the money you're going to receive, then you'll be able to say, it. I always believe there's a better client coming tomorrow. And it happens. It's who you are. And, 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 and surprisingly, there are some people come and say, you can't imagine that lawyer. She did this and this. She's very principled. She's very principled. The people go and say, that one. If you can do this and she doesn't do anything, what if the other side brings money? Can she competently handle my brief? So it's just about self-empowerment, self-empowerment. No client is rich enough to buy your body. No client is rich enough to begin touching you without your consent. It should be that simple. Then if it goes on and you, you withdraw from handling this case, we have you know, provisions that can speak to that. And the, the, those provisions are similar across all East African countries. Uh, to Sekire and uh, Imachalit spoke ably about those provisions. There are always uh, avenues to really address uh, advances, unwanted advances from uh, clients, unwanted advances from judicial officers, unwanted advances from persons who are not our employers. The hardest uh, group to handle is that of people we live with every single day of our professional lives. I think that is the most problematic uh, 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 group to handle. Back to you, Elizabeth. Yes, uh, Miss uh, Immaculate and then Miss Tusekile before we proceed. Um, one minute, please. Yeah? Sorry, one minute each, and then we proceed to the uh, last bit before we get into the QA. Okay. So, um, one, I would say establishing boundaries, just like um, my colleague has said. Um, yes, speaking up, of course, is a very uh, fundamental aspect. But for me, I would say if I found myself in a similar situation, I would say communicate to someone within the firm. It could be a senior partner, could be just someone in the firm so that even if there can be maybe a switch of who is handling this client's matter, I think that could to some extent help. So communicate with someone who is in a position to do something, including um, a switch of who is handling this brief. Of course, that will be uh, in consideration of issues like the financial benefits that you'll attain from um, working with this client. Yes, um, and maybe the other thing is also um, where you work also matters. Um, I think it's very important to ask upfront, what, what do you do in such a situation, right? So that you also have a clear idea of who is your employer and that will give you a realistic expectations of what they can do in the event that such, such a thing arises. Thank you. Yeah, again, I go back to what I said earlier, because ideally, if you do have a good safeguarding policy, it should safeguard your employees both against internal and external harassment. And so again, when it happens, I know where to go. Um, however, yes, I agree in all circumstances, you need to report because in my experience, these things escalate. It never ends up in one comment. So if you don't report and then you come to report when things are worse, it becomes even harder uh, to kind of go through that case and eventually win the case because people have the tendency of saying, why didn't you say earlier? It's not, uh, I don't think sometimes people understand why people don't say earlier, but yeah, always report. It kind of protects you as the victim as you go along through the process. And then there's also responsibility. I, call it a responsibility of a bystander. If you see something, say something. Like most of the times we see, you see your colleague being like, there was a comment that we all looked at each other and you're looking and you're like, okay, this is not good. But sometimes we look and then we keep quiet. So I think we also have a responsibility to create an organizational culture as, as coworkers, you know, as the boss, if you hear it, 
say something and don't just ignore. So yeah, uh, going back to what all of them have said, saying something actually helps. Yes, uh, thank you. So now um, we have uh, various law societies and you also have the umbrella body, which is the EALS. What role do you think um, the law societies have in enforcing these codes of conduct or certain behavior? Because again, also within our profession, we have a manner in which we should present ourselves and also a manner in which we should treat our colleagues, right? Um, what is the role of the law society uh, according to you, or what can the role, what can the law societies do in order now to curb this vice? Because it's already happening. We're not talking about future occurrences or things that might happen in the future. We're talking about something that's already actually happening in our, our workplaces. And what do you think the role of mentorship is within our society? How can um, senior lawyers also mentor younger lawyers in the sense that already you know that such and such conduct is going to be counted as harassment within the workplace. So kindly refrain, refrain from such things. Yes, maybe we start with Mr. Lusimbi and then Immaculate and finish off with Ms. Tusekile. Okay, as ELS, I think we need to, to really have a, a deeper review of our employment leg, uh, legislation, in particular the, the regulations covering uh, sexual harassment and ask ourselves, are they comprehensive enough to speak to the changing times? Uh, sexual harassment is taking different forms, but our re regulations in tandem with the changing time, are they responsive enough to address uh, these changing uh, uh, times and manifestations of sexual harassment? Uh, and maybe through the different country uh, societies, lawyers influence, uh, uh, amendments and reviews, uh, legislative reviews or amendments. Uh, for example, I don't think that uh, using uh, uh, regulations on sexual harassment in Uganda, that having uh, a, a regulation requiring that only an employer having 25 plus employees, the one supposed to have policy, is really a right for you, uh, legislation that can speak to, to the vice. I don't need to have 25 to harass. I only need to have one. So it should be about any employer, and it doesn't matter how many employees you have. Two, have we taken steps to ensure that uh, as we focus on other uh, matters affecting uh, the rule of law in East Africa, are we giving attention to sexual harassment as much as we give to, for example, democracy, because the LIPO effect is, it can be so quite daunting. We, we really need to speak about this beyond ELS and have focus on these topics in the different member societies. I don't remember when the last time I had something like this uh, under Uganda Law Society. So we take things for granted, yet they are not. And when we churn out these young lawyers, some of them are actually complaining. In Uganda, we have what we call clerkship. We, are, we send uh, our bar students to what would be an externship to, to gain practical experience. And they are complaining. Senior lawyers are uh, sexually assaulting them. So we really need to, as East African law society, to talk to the membership of different countries to make this really topical and something we need to really address as East Africa. Mm. Uh, Liz, uh, please remind me of the, the, the last leg of your question. Yes, uh, basically I was asking about the role of the law societies and also um, the impact of men, men, uh, mentorship and whether yeah, true, true, it should be true, man, true. mandatory. Yes, yeah. yes. You, like the saying goes, you are the people you look up to, okay? And uh, that is very important. If we have senior lawyers quite all on in the life of the young lawyers talking to them, letting them know the perils of the workspaces beyond what we teach at law schools, I think it could be quite uh, an interesting learning experience for our lawyers to now tackle some of these challenges beyond the law. There's a lot of power in soft power. There's a lot of power in how you conduct yourself in combating sexual harassment but you don't appear 
in a, in a law class and the lecture lectures you are now to, to conduct yourself. So mentorship is very, very instrumental. And uh, how do we teach our young lawyers to patiently wait for their time to, to live the kind of life they want? I think also the urge to live large quite early now professionalizes also kind of open the window for this harassment. You see a man has money, does something because he's promising you money, like what he's going to pay for, 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 my, for my hostel, he's going to pay for my car, my car is in need of service. And this gentleman, despite him doing things I don't want, I can financially benefit from him. That has been a problem. That has really been a problem. Young lawyers, seeing senior lawyers, possible 20, 30 years experience, closing life as they call it in those ballistic rights. And he or she also has the same right. It has taken 20 years to get that car, to get there. But do these young lawyers, have they been made aware of what it takes to get there? That patience is one of the key virtues that you don't have to use your body. You don't have someone to have someone abuse you, your, your, your body integrity to get what you want to get. I think their mentorship plays a very key role. And I surely agree with you that uh, as a way of combating uh, sexual harassment in workspaces where attorneys are involved, I think mentorship from senior lawyers is key and comes in handy. Back to you, please. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, we'll go on to Miss Immaculate and then uh, Ms. Asajile. Okay, so um, I think for me, I would say one, um, sexually, sexual harassment and bullying, there's a target group for it, right? You have to be vulnerable. You can't be the boss. It's very rare, let me say that. It's rare for you to be high up the ladder and still face these same things. So I would say one, in Kenya, for instance, there is no um, sexual harassment policy or anti-bullying policy for pupils. And I know this forum is probably for advocates who've been admitted and and so forth. But I would say the foundation is very um, important because um, you harass someone as a pupil, they carry that on throughout their, their whole career. Now they want to harass everyone, now they're the sexual harasser, now they're the bully at the workplace. So I would say um, it is very important in, in, in the Kenyan context specifically to come up with a law that protects pupils. And maybe at this point, we can release advocates who are not wounded, who are not hurt, who are not sexually harassed, who are not bullying, right? And I, and I think that is a very important um, mandate of LSK, because currently I, I, we have the SOPEC, which is the LSK Code of Conduct that is for advocates. Um, but you see, even if you search sexual harassment in there, there's a very small portion of it. Like, and it's not even touching on those who are outside the, 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 the umbrella of the law society of Kenya. So I think we need to be proactive and especially for pupils uh, and other um, vulnerable groups. In terms of mentorship, I would say um, you go to a law firm, you find a bully. That bully found a fertile environment for bullying and they carried it on. They became a bully. And people saw that they were a bully, didn't say anything. They continued living their lives. So mentorship is in the sense of, if you're a senior advocate, um, I think young advocates are looking up to you, right? You enter the office and everyone is trembling. You're creating a very perfect environment for bullying because um, the moment you're out, someone else will want to make the rest tremble. It's not gonna be you, but you've raised another bully already. The cycle continues. So I think mentorship, you can, the, 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 the realest form of mentorship is how you act. Sexually harass people, now even the clerk will start sexually harassing people as a senior um, member of that firm. Yes, so that will be um, my contribution to that. Yeah, just to add on all uh, what Immaculate and Havik just said, I think we should start with the awareness. Because as much as we keep saying this, the law, this, this, most of the people don't know. The people who are actually supposed to know don't know. So like uh, we all say that we do need to have more of these workshops, more of these seminars. And, and, and like Immaculate said, it should not start here. It should not start after the bar. And then that's when you start knowing, oh, this is wrong. You sh we should start way early, like from our law schools, we should have 
uh, our law society is preparing these workshops, engaging people and so that they know. So by the time they're in the workforce, they are ready for these things. Most of us got into the workforce not knowing. And, and, and yes, I complete, I know and the statistics show that uh, male, um, there's also harassment for male. Uh, and But most of us uh, who face uh, sexual harassment, especially uh, female lawyers who in the system itself is already, the legal sector is very patriarchal. So there's already that dynamic from the beginning. So you get into it, you didn't know anything, and now you're there. So you have to figure your way through this very uh, male dominated sector. But if we were told these things before, if, if, we're, if, if we're told this before, these things before, it will not only help us, but it will also help those who are likely to harass us, to harass the people. It will also help them to know that, okay, I didn't know these jokes were not supposed to be said, but now I know, so I'm not going to do this. So we, it, it really helps if we start there. Like, let's start with that awareness. As, as, as East Africa Law Society, let's start there. So even doing this, this is already a step towards where we want to go. But then also, I think we also need to do a proper inquiry. I know there was an inquiry done globally by, um, I don't remember very well, but there was an inquiry done globally. But maybe as in East Africa, we need to come up with our own report. We need to see uh, what is the extent of the problem? What are the, are the causes of this problem in our context? Because not everything that applies globally applies to us. Right now, right now, for example, we are facing a lot of challenges with like cyberbullying. A lot of people are being bullied. Uh, and so how do we combat that in our own, uh, in, in our using the laws we have or our non-existing laws? How do we champion the making of laws that protect us? So I think that's also very important. But also, I think we also need to uh, create environments in which we, we as lawyers don't try to solve everything on our own. Let's involve people who actually know like people who are experts in this field, people who uh, can help us. Because most, if you, if I go maybe to the aspect of an abuser, most abusers, I immaculate say it, hurt people, hurt people. So if most abusers have faced sort of a trauma somewhere, they have a background somewhere. So if I involve a mental health expert, let's say, who will be there to give them like proper therapy and all the help they need, then they come out not doing it. And then they come out as a testimony to others that you can actually change. And they are going to help others not do the same. Because if we only focus on the victim, the abuser will continue, the harasser will continue, the bully will continue. So we need to focus on both aspects of this coin. I think as a, as a law society, we have a really huge power. And we've, we've talked even today how, how many laws we don't have, how many code of conduct we don't have. And, and, and I, I, I believe if um, Herbert uh, just talked about the gap in the 25, the number, to, the you need to have 25 employees, it's the same for uh, here as well. But I'm thinking if the East Africa Law Society can stand up and unite uh, with all the law societies in East Africa and say it is mandated that every firm must have a code of conduct, I think we there we are, we are going somewhere, and then we have a template that is good, that a template that provides for all these problems. You know, a good policy that has all the features that we need in a good policy that will combat sexual harassment and bullying. So thank you very much for that. Thank you also for highlighting the need for uh, mentorship from senior partners and also enforcement of um, the requirement to have a sexual uh, harassment policy. Maybe something to note as we go along. Um, I, we are aware that, well, I am aware that um, the LSK, the Law Society of Kenya does have uh, the template that you're talking about. We do have a sexual harassment um, uh, code and um, the problem now is with regards to enforcement of the same. How do you hold uh, law firms accountable 
for that. And also, um, Immaculate had also mentioned something to do with uh, pupillage and ensuring that uh, when uh, students actually are joining the force or are trying to join the, the legal workforce, that they're also protected from um, the type of bias or um, harassment that they will find there. And one of the moves that is being done in our society is that um, there's an attempt to work the Kenya School of Law is sort of attempting to work together with the LSK to, with the LSK to ensure that when pupils re, uh, report harassment to the school, that the LSK will actually hold the perpetrators accountable under the, the mechanism within the society. Right. So maybe that is something we can uh, sort of try to emulate uh, in um, in the region. Now, the last thing I want to talk about before we get to answer, uh, addressing the questions that have been asked here um, is the issue of mental health, right? So again, we know that uh, sexual harassment and bullying does affect people's mental health, and it, it also um, takes a while before a victim comes and actually says it out loud that they are being harassed, yeah? So because of the nature of our work where we work in very busy workplaces, um, what are the tips that you can give to our listeners with regards to dealing with um, harassment or, and, or uh, bullying in the workplace? How do they balance, how should they balance their work life and their, um, and their um, emotional life, right? Without work spilling into your personal life and also further affecting your life at home. And maybe um, together with that, we can finish off by talking about any resources that you know that advocates can um, employ um, within their workplaces in order to deal with this problem because it is still continuing even as we speak, right? So how do you achieve a work-life balance for your mental health? And also uh, what uh, resources or networks do you know that advocates can either join or use to deal with these issues? Uh, uh, thank you once again. I think it's very important that uh, we keep our family ties closer and uh, that network of friends, people who know us, people who share the same values we share closer. There's a tendency of lawyers to get lost in their world of work. Someone leaves home at six in the morning, they're getting back home at nine. All the baggage, all the luggage, every Every, every kind of uh, abuses, insults experienced at work is bottled because there's no one to speak to. By the time you get home, maybe family members are sleeping. Your family, your friends, you can't meet your friends maybe until Sunday. No lawyers work throughout uh, Saturday. Like your social fabric is broken. Your safety net, people you speak to, people you, you can confide in, you hardly find time for them. And uh, I think those family ties, uh, the society ties we have created over years of our lives play a key role in who we finally become. So it is very important that whenever you meet, you, 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 you kind of uh, experience such uh, abuses at work, at workspace, you talk to people who matter to you. It doesn't matter whether you have them physically, a phone call away. And that, in a way, can help in, in, in the mental well-being of attorneys. Mental welfare is a very critical aspect of our bearing. And there's a study, I'm forgetting, I'm forgetting it, I would have quoted it for the members, that found that lawyers were the most mentally affected professionals in the world. And, and that was really awakening. And the reason why that is true is because of the kind of work we do. Imagine you're handling this case, with all this sort of evidence that is unparatable for your eyes. And then you, on top of that, you have your, 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 your senior partner, your boss, so to say, harassing you. The mental consequences of that can be quite severe. And if you just bottle it up and you have no one to speak to, it can even get worse. So let's speak out, not only within the circles of people who give us this, the kind of legal solution or formal solution, but also for people who will give us emotional support and psychological support to overcome uh, these abuses. 
And uh, in terms of uh, how can we as lawyers, for example, in Uganda, try to, to, to combat this? It's a common practice that all lawyer, law firms have uh, make weekly meetings. You're meeting to discuss uh, different cases coming up. On Monday, for example, on how it, they're going to be handled, why don't you throw in a discussion on sexual harassment? Let it start as an innocent discussion and it can open up a door for a policy for the firm. It can open up a door to make sure that you operate in a secure environment, not only for you, but also for the young lawyers who will join maybe after you exit. So in my view, Liz, I think those are uh, uh, the things that young lawyers can do, not only young lawyers, lawyers across the spectrum. There are things really that will help us address uh, the, ch the challenges brought by uh, uh, bullying and sexual harassment. Let us speak to our loved ones. Let us speak about this in our workspaces. It doesn't have to be on the agenda to be thrown in as long as it affects the quality of work of each lawyer in that company, in that firm. So back to you, Liz. All right, thank you. Uh, maybe we'll finish off with Kagoto Immaculate, then finish off with uh, Mr. Sekile as a mental health expert. Okay. Um, for me, I would say one will be a firm's reputation. I don't know if that makes sense. And I understand that employment is a big issue and you, you may not have the luxury of saying, I want this farm because it has a child, because it has what, but I would say where there's smoke, there's fire, right? You have, you have, you have a farm that KSL has complaints of them being ma massive sexual harassers. I mean, that's a red flag right there. And unless it's your last resort, listen to, listen to what people say. Of course, sometimes there are wrong rumors, but sometimes where there's smoke, there's fire, you can tend to avoid such workplaces. I would say number two, um, look at the contract that you're being given to sign. If your contract says you have to work maybe until Saturday 6 p.m. or until Sunday, I mean, that's, that's an upfront red flag. And again, sometimes you're desperate, but if you have the luxury of choosing where to work, you might want to work somewhere where maybe it's just Monday to Friday or something of that sort. And number three, I would say take your weekends, yeah? And there's always the temptation to just keep working, keep working, keep working, keep working. But at some point you have to stop and look at your life, look at your family, just rest. Uh, and then the last one I would say therapy really helps. Um, and, and I'll connect this with the issue of resources. Um, so I would say I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a huge advocate for therapy. I think it helps a great deal because sometimes you find a young advocate would at the same time be a single advocate like you go home to your house don't go home to your uncle to your auntie to your mom to your dad so then that escalates the situation and which means you're not telling anyone about um, the troubles that you're going through so you might want to consider therapy which leads me to the point of resources i would say in kenya i know one um, organization that does i don't know if they still do pro bono therapy but if it's not pro bono then it's um, subsidized to an extent um, they're called Mental360. I think you can search for them um, either on Instagram or online. Um, number two, I would say there's an NGO I know of in Kenya that is interested in the rights of women particularly. Um, that is Center for Rights Education and Awareness. That is Crew Kenya. I think they've probably taken up a few matters regarding sexual harassment. And also I think firms should invest in um, team building activities. I mean, it, it helps for, for a minute, let it not be about paperwork or office work. We, you can have fun, talk, and yeah, just see how to um, move forward as an establishment. Yeah, that will be my contribution. Thank you, Immaculate and Habit. So yeah, um, they all say the, um, I think the most comprehensive things that we need to do. Uh, it's it's a difficult balance, we all know, especially now we live in a world where uh, economic pressures are high, social pressures are high, and so we tend to work. And as lawyers, our work is uh, really stressful. And yes, lawyers are among the top five professionals 
that suffer from mental breakdowns. It's because of the nature of our work. So you need, like, first, it's like individual. You have to start with yourself first. Take an inventory of yourself and how you feel. Uh, you have to listen to your body. We have the tendency of saying, I can push through, I can push through, I can do this, I can do this. Two more hours, I'll sleep, you know, I'll sleep tomorrow. Uh, today I'm pulling an all-nighter. It's important, it's important. Uh, but I think everybody should be able to ask themselves, what is more important, your work or your life? Because in the end, uh, going through a mental breakdown, you're going to take so much time off because then there's no, there's no an easy. One of the hardest things to go through is going through a mental health challenge because there's no quick fix. It takes so much time, it takes so much effort. It takes right now, at least in my country, so much money because insurance rarely covers. So now you're going, all the money you were working for so you could enjoy, you're gonna use it on countless therapists, which are ridiculously expensive because they are few. So now, uh, I'm, I'm, if you don't have that culture of you yourself being responsible for your own mental health, even if an organization puts this, which is good, like there should be an organizational culture for, let's say, having company retreats, having uh, weekend check-ins. I, I see a lot of companies doing uh, checkups. We do, I think it's annual, some do by annual, uh, you do health checkups. But uh, only recently I've seen a few companies in mandating when you do a physical checkup, you also do a psychological checkup. Most of the time we just do the physical checkups and then you're fine, you're fine. There's no disease in your body. That's fine. Go and work. But not knowing that your, your, your well-being, your mental well-being has actually the biggest role because when you're stressed, even your physical body is also impacted. So it's important to do a self-inventory. If right now we finish this seminar and then uh, it just ends and we, you have not done anything, it won't help you. But you need to actually take, take this seriously because it will actually impact your productivity. But then also you need to rely on your social support. Everyone should have social support. We live now in an urban culture that is more leaning towards being an individual, and being uh, independent, and which is good, but then it, we are social beings. So your social support is very important. And your social support could be different things. You know, if you don't have, it's always good to have things outside work. Your work should never be your world. You should be just be a part of it, but not everything. So you need to find social support. If you're a church person, go to church. If you're a sport person, do sports. Like if you have friends, make time because you're not wasting time. You're actually building yourself up to be a better person and a more productive person. And then also, let's just have a culture of seeking for help. I see this a lot, especially as you grow uh, older in the profession. We have a tendency of hoarding things and thinking that I can do this much better. Uh, we need to learn how to delegate and train and mentor and the younger and the younger and the younger, like every generation that comes in, just being able to not hold every work by yourself. Because if you don't learn to delegate, then you're gonna go into the uh, the sake of overworking and then being burnt down. And then when you have you're going through a burnout, that's a different story altogether. Then it's just a vicious cycle. So just knowing when what is your limit and knowing how to help are seeking for help. Seeking for help is never a weakness. And, and in that same manner, seeking for help, professional help, when you when you see that um, I'm at a point where I need to talk to someone, uh, please, like, let's seek professional help. I know we still don't have a lot around. I, I know even if you take an inventory of East Africa as, as in general, we don't have a lot of around. But there are so many other people that you can use to be your, your support guide. So to be sort of like mental health coach, I can say. It, it doesn't have, uh, if, you, if, you're, if you're able to afford a therapist, that's really, really good. But if you're not able to afford one, there are other people you could talk to. We have, we have like, for example, people in religious organizations that have sort of like counseling degrees, some of them, just be wise in who you choose because they have a lot of impact in how uh, you relate 
with other people. And just uh, generally, let's manage, let's learn how to manage our stressors. Uh, just avoiding way too many stresses. There are things that should not be uh, should not be on top of your stresses. Managing managing stress, yes, it's a longer thing, and probably I won't go into the details of it. But just learning. The thing is, we have the information out there. That's the the beauty of the, the current generation we live in. If you enter Google how to manage stress, there'll be so many things, there'll be so many toolkits that you can use. So the same way we are very eager on knowing what is the new law that has come up, how, what is the new thing that is in the law, let's be also very eager to know this thing so that we can keep ourselves well. And then for sort of a toolkit for sexual harassment, there's a lot of really nice toolkits made by the UN. So if you just go in the UN, if you just Google toolkits UN, you'll find there's really nice toolkits. They give you, especially if you're in, uh, if you're in the management, you don't need to come, you don't need to come up from scratch with the training material. There's a lot of them. They're very nice. You can just tailor them to your organizational needs. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you for um, that input on uh, dealing with uh, mental health and uh, stress and also achieving a work-life balance. Now we're getting into the questions. Again, I'd like to remind our listeners to uh, put up any questions they have in the Q&A area or in the chat box or even any comments they have with regards to this webinar. And as we finish off, um, I'm going to just go through the questions. And the first question we have from Abdul Maliki, who's wondering, how do you deal with frivolous uh, complaints for sexual harassment? Because we do know that there are certain scenarios where, um, yes, um, because of the nature of the complaint, uh, maybe a particular farm has very stringent, stringent rules on sexual harassment, and some people do take advantage of that to probably retaliate, maybe because you didn't do what they wanted to do and report you for sexual harassment. So in such cases, um, what tips can you give uh, our listeners in dealing with um, frivolous complaints? Can start with Mr. Walusimbi, then we go to Ms. Asajila and finish with Ms. Were. Okay. Uh, when you look at our regulations against uh, sexual harassment, in particular Regulation 18, it says that uh, when an employee raises a frivolous a uh, sexual harassment claim against an employer. An employer can initiate disciplinary action against uh, the employee. However, there's no more light on how, on what kind of sanction the employer can take, but I believe as lawyers, we know the possible consequences out, uh, arising out of a, a frivolous sexual harassment claim. And, and that in the in the way also raises concerns. Will it mean that now the the procedures provided under the law for termination may be circumvented because the boss is angry? They want you out. They will not hear you out to understand the genesis of your claim. That is as far as our regulations go. They don't show what you can do, but I think you can also run to, to, to the penal code within the context of Uganda. There's, a, there's a, an offense on a, a, a defamation. For example, if the, the claim has been published to other employees and that has lowered how people look at you as an employer, I think that is another uh, remedy you can seek to, to, to get as an employer. But I don't think it should really be a punitive uh, step taken by an employer wherever a frivolous claim has been raised. And the question is, what constitutes a frivolous claim? You may do something that, from my culture, we come from different tribes. We perceive things differently. East Africa is so diverse in terms of uh, tribes. Maybe my sisters from Kenya may not be as many, but here we have so many tribes that I even lost count of them. But if I come from a tribe where you do something, it is perceived as an harassment, you know, thing. And I, I report you for sexual harassing me, yet maybe the community finds more than something that can be perceived as an, a sexual harassment thing. So that is what we have under the law. And, uh, 
because it is not really precise about what constitutes a frivolous complaint crossed in sexual harassment, we need to be clear our regulations, our laws must be precise. There shouldn't be room to, to doubt what constitutes a uh, frivolous uh, uh, sexual harassment claim because every day there are new aspects of sexual harassment. So the, 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 the bracket is not closed. It's about perception and how I feel when you do something. I think that is what I can say, uh, Liz, uh, back to you. Right. So, mm -hmm. Yes, Mr. Uh, so I think here, um, the one who asked the question already has a good answer for me. That's my answer as well. If you have a good policy that has proper complaint procedures and how you listen to the person, those good techniques that we learned on cross-examination, you know, as you're talking to a person reporting, just like if you if you talk to a person, you might actually be able to sniff out the lie. It's not a hundred percent. Sometimes people go through some people are very good at making up things, and we have seen this happening several times. Um, so I would say one of the deterrent is just having that really comprehensive policy. Just it, it might help you. Because before even somebody files it, they think of going through that process and all the things they probably need to do, and they might actually think, okay, no, I'm not going, I'm not going to pull this through. But if you don't have uh, a, a balanced policy, because most of the problem sometimes is that the policy might, might sometimes be very victim oriented. And so this creates this dynamic of uh, victims who are not genuine victims being able to circumvent that policy. So you need to be able to have a comprehensive policy that balances out both sides. Yes, uh, Ms. Ware, thank you. Ms. Ms. Asabila. Yes, I think I'll just pick up from where the other speakers have left. Um, it's all about um, investigation procedures and you can make investigation procedures um, proof to to some of these free, free, frivolous complaints and also i'll go a step further to the question of again who investigates like what qualifications do they have do they have any experience with um similar matters because then if you find someone with zero experience and who is just acting on whim and you know guesswork they will not deliver what you want and some of these frivolous complaints will will pass them but um yeah but i would say again um i would say we have to be very cautious with um calling some of these complaints frivolous and um i would say maybe as a first resort believe the survivor first and then when you get to the investigation and then it is proven that they're lying then at that point then you can turn the wheel just to to, to avoid a situation where someone has a general complaint and we now end up um, labeling it as um, a frivolous complaint. Yes, that's what I have to say. All right, so I will address the next question to Mr. Walu Simbi because it appears to be uh, dealing with Ugandan legislation where Abdullah Ging is asking, how do we deal with gender insensitive legislation? where the law is only seen to be protecting the female employee, right? So I, I believe this is in a scenario where we also talk about the fact that um, male employees also do get sexually harassed or do get um, um, bullied in the workplace. Okay, uh, thank you for that question. Malik, I, I saw it in the chat room. Maybe I was misunderstood uh, because when you look at our legislation they're really gender sensitive they're gender neutral you're talking they're talking about employee employer there's nothing like a, a female employer or something like that so it, and then the, the legislations can be accessed online you can have a look at them i mean they are gender sensitive surely they are thank you thank you for that so the next question is about in-house counsel um how can um or what can be done to insist on the implementation of the employment act with regards to the requirement for sexual harassment policy 
in workplaces of um, uh, with people more than with more than twenty uh, workers. Um, I believe we talked a bit about that, but maybe any person can give an intervention on that. Maybe Miss Asajile. Um, so, like we said earlier, it's not only legal spaces. Every place should have a workplace policy. Every place should have an anti-bullying and anti-sexual harassment workplace policy. So I think as an in-house counsel, what you can do is try and sort of influence your employer to have one. It uh, So for Tanganyika, well, Tanzania mainland, for Tanzania mainland, we don't have the requirement of the 25 because we actually don't even have the requirement of the policy. Zanzibar has the requirement of the 25, but it does have a requirement of every workplace having a sex, um, an anti-discrimination law. So an anti-discrimination law kind of helps. It is not really specific to sexual harassment only, which is the bigger problem but you may start there. So I think sometimes you have to start from somewhere as you're growing towards getting there, having that more comprehensive policy. But every workplace should have, at the very least, an anti-discrimination policy. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, Ms. Julu from Tanzania is wondering whether um, young male lawyers also face, face sexual harassment from senior women advocates. I believe from the um, studies that have uh, been done, um, there is an equal, not really equal, but there's also a good number of, of, of male advocates who do complain of the same thing. Uh, maybe one of you can talk about that, um, about the issue of, uh, because the issue of gender balance had also come up where someone also stated that the laws are also a bit, they sound gender insensitive. Maybe Ms. Immaculate? Yes, um, I think just like you said, the statistics show that men almost equally experience sexual harassment in workplaces. I think the only issue is um, maybe it is not talked about enough in terms of awareness. We don't really publicize or we don't have that many men coming up and saying, I have been sexually harassed at the workplace. And also there's the societal expectation, you know, that men are this masculine, strong, there's no way they can be harassed. So I think it's a conversation that we need to keep going. There's so much awareness that needs to be spread on um, the, the, the challenges that men face. But I'll tell you for a fact and from experiences that I've had even from my colleagues, men do um, experience sexual assault almost to an equal degree as women and and the statistics have captured that yes thank you now this is a general question uh from again abdul thank you for the several questions that you have uh, put up um uh he's asking how do you strengthen the compliance mechanism for sexual the sexual harassment policy because talked about all these codes and all these policies that we assume all advocates are aware about but how do you ensure that um law firms actually comply the same i can start with mr sajile then we go to mr lucimbi and finally miss Ware. Okay, so the first i think is just being able to clarify accountability, uh, who does what at what stage. So like if you if you say, let's say, uh, if two uh, if two says are asked, the first place to report, let's say maybe is uh, a HR, preferably have a different place, but yeah, maybe it's the HR. And then from there, what is the investigative mechanism making sure that the investigative body is as independent as possible because that is where the challenge comes in like you might have it on paper but then the practicalities of it is like oh this one who's investigating is like the likelihood of this one and the perpetrator knowing each other so yeah and if you can even if you can uh, if you're able to engage an outsider in the investigative procedures even better one someone that will be independent and who will look at this issue more objectively than all of you. But also just knowing that uh, if the process does not go 
as smooth as well if if the process does not go satisfactory to the victim where can they go you kind of having an internal appeal mechanism before they they pursue external mechanisms it helps with strengthening that aspect of like it's not a one week process and then we're like oh we did our investigation we are done and then if i'm not satisfied then i'm starting to go through a whole other process and like and for example like in tanzania you have a 60 60 day limit so if the process internally takes more than that you can't go in and 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 and, and, and have any external recourse mechanism. So as an internal complaint procedure, you need to have sort of like a, 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 an on the ground and then like an appellate mechanism before you go through uh, outside mechanism if somebody is not satisfied with the outcome. Then uh, maybe taking one from uh, where cancer surgery left. Other than uh, having these policies, we have heavily spoken about them uh, in this meeting. We need also to ensure that uh, we popularize these policies among the employees. Let's create that awareness across the board. And when you do that, let us protect the persons who report against discrimination. From the point of reporting to filing the complaint, testifying as witnesses, cooperating during investigation, participating in meeting for consultation regarding the, 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 the complaint lodged. There shouldn't be consequences like termination, denial of promotion, demotion in title duties. We shouldn't have involuntary placement on leave because of a complaint on sexual harassment decreasing in remuneration or other benefits that the employee was initially enjoying, coercion and threats should really be limited if you are to address this price. And those safety nets must be within our law. Liz, that is all from me. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, Ms. Ware? Um, I would say on my part, apart from just creating awareness will be willingness to implement this law because um, i think this conversation you may think that our bosses are aliens but our bosses are just advocates like us which means willingness will really go a long way especially um, from senior advocates who have established these firms that we get to work in um, apart from that i think there should also be penalties for maybe for firms that do not um, tend to implement uh, sexual harassment policies. Like for instance, a farm has more than 20 employees, they have a policy. A an issue arises, they don't handle it until it gets to KSL, it gets to LSK, it gets to Advocates Disciplinary Tribunal. I mean, something should happen to this farm because where have they been all this while and why are, not, are they not um, taking this issue seriously? So maybe there should be penalties also introduced to establishments that do not take this complaint seriously especially when they escalate to a certain level yes uh yes um i think that ties into um another question that's been asked about uh by flaviana about what can be done to employers who are not compliant with the rules and procedures uh, we've talked about penalties and uh, all of that maybe we can just have one more intervention on that uh, from Asajile, what can be done to employers who are not compliant? And then we'll deal with the last question. Thank you, Michael. I kind of mentioned it a bit. I was thinking the same. So there's in other jurisdictions, actually, there is a, they've put a vicarious liability for an employer who does not help an employee who is going through sexual harassment. And they look at it in terms of like, you could have done something and you didn't. So if uh, we go back to the discussion on what can the law societies do, if we are vibrant enough to see that if a person who can, can go to the disciplinary board and say, my employer was supposed to protect me against this, but they did not. And so they should also be responsible, not just the person who harassed me, but them should also be responsible. But I think the biggest challenge is 
having a legal sector that is really supportive of this because one of the problems and I've, we've seen it in, in tanzania we had a case of a of a lady who reported someone who was very prominent and she has become a social par pariah because no other the firm wants to hire her, they call her the person who always reports. So like if we have a legal sector that is supportive of this culture, that we call ourselves out, that will help more than even having any law. Yes, thank you very much. Um, now I'll tie in the last two questions. I believe I saw a question somewhere about any appeal uh, system, for example, I guess I believe that was uh, tying in the question on frivolous um complaints uh, i'll tie that together with um, whether we have any president president on um uh, any case in east africa on sexual harassment so we'll start with mr lucimbi going to um miss Ware, and then finally finish with uh miss asajile we'll talk about maybe the um maybe we probably just need a brief overview of the of the system itself if we're talking about an appeal system right when you make a complaint especially I, I believe this could be in the sense of um, within our law societies okay I, I really get a feeling looking at our regulations on uh, uh, sexual harassment that had, they were not well thought out. Maybe the the, the legislation was was haphazard. They just felt there's a problem here, and let's think of something. And then there we had a, a regulation. Because when you look at the regulations, every employer, as I earlier pointed out, was 25 and above employees is supposed to have a policy, and you should set up a sexual harassment committee. Now. What is provided in regulations, if the employee, for example, finds uh, the, the work of uh, the committee wanting, it opens up a window for that particular employee to run to the labor officer of that particular district. Uganda is divided in districts to report to the labor officer to take the next step of action. And there are provisions on what the labor officer should do to hear the, the complaint. Other than that, there's no really so much door open for court processes. But uh, we have a provision within our uh, Judicature Act, which really empowers the High Court to hear all complaints where someone alleges the violation of their rights. So I think it's something an aggrieved employee who thinks that uh, either the Sexual Harassment Committee and the Labor Office are didn't hand Oh, sorry, I forgot something. There's also an industrial court. An industrial court is presided over by, by the judge. I think there's also that pro, that, that window of uh, now going to the industrial court uh, to make sure that this particular complaint is handled. Uh, refer to the industrial court under Regulation 14 for their colleagues who will be interested in finding out how Uganda handles sexual harassment. But, when you look at everything in totality, really, there's no clear pathway. There's, there's no clear demarcation of roles on what, who does what, after what stage. There's lack of precise clarity, and that means so much coming from a lawyer. So we, we really need to ensure that we, we, we go back on a drawing table as East Africa and think of these legislations addressing uh, sexual harassment. They're not comprehensive. I've had uh, cancer surgery, I've had from immaculate, we really need to have, uh, we really need to have a lot of uh, soul searching and reviewing of these uh, legislations if we are to comprehensively combat the vice, legally speaking. But also you, you're very well aware that uh, laws alone without uh, enforcement, which uh, Ms. Wheeler spoke to, there will be redundant legislations. Elizabeth, are you there? Council Elizabeth? Uh, yes, I'm here. Sorry about that. Um, we can go on to Miss uh, Were and then finish off with Miss Sajili on this day. Um, I think from, from a Kenyan perspective, I think the, the right to appeal is well entrenched in law. Um, and for instance, if you if you have a 
if you have a person that has been maybe an advocate that has been taken to the advocate's disciplinary tribunal i think the the, the law is quite clear on where to go next that will be the high court um, and also let's say there's an employment claim against you um, maybe lodged as a small claims or whatever court that someone might lodge a claim against you what you do is in the Kenyan system, there's a whole hierarchy of laws up to the Supreme Court. So then you can you can take it up, take it to the High Court, take it to the Court of Appeal, take it to the Supreme Court. Or for example, if they went to a labor officer, you can refer that matter maybe to a chief magistrate court. So I think um, the appeal mechanism is there. And I think um, the person who asked this is particularly concerned with the right to fair hearing. So I would say um, from a Kenyan point of view, I don't see a difficulty at all in um, appealing from any decision, either from, from, from a place of work, from a labor officer, from a chief magistrate court, there's, there's always an appeal mechanism from the Kenyan point of view. So yeah, I, I'm not very different from my colleagues. Um, I, th I, I would say there are very few cases in my jurisdiction, unfortunately, that have specifically invoked Section 138, which is the one that deals with sexual harassment per se. But we have a few cases of where, in instances where sexual harassment has uh, escalated to rape. Um, however, I would like to point out the difficulty in proving sexual harassment in the first place. Maybe that's one of the reasons why we don't have a lot of the cases. Proving sexual harassment beyond reasonable doubt in a place where you're just too probably, it's a difficult process. But then again, uh, with the right to appeal externally, like Immaculate say, that's clear, the, the procedure is clear. Internally, that needs to be put by the specific organization. Uh, but also one of the challenges is the fact that most of uh, cases of sexual harassment are solved internally and people are given hush money and then there's nothing else that goes on after that so i think that's the biggest challenge so far that's uh, why well, i don't maybe there i know there are other challenges but i think for me looking at all the other challenges that's the biggest why uh, most cases don't go as far as in the courts it's just people decide, well, I'm gonna get my money and then that's it. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, maybe now briefly, as we finish, uh, maybe you can give us your concluding remarks, your recommendations, and uh, basic, just a summary, a brief summary in one or two minutes each um, as we finish, thank you. Okay, what I can say is uh, sexual harassment is as bad as having a uh, factory work go into uh, the factory space without protective uh, gear. It is that bad that any time that person can die. And the uh, environment, work environment, where there's sexual harassment is as bad as that for a casual worker working in a factory, manufacturing where there's a lot of machinery moving up and down. And it takes all of us to make each other safe in our different workspaces. It is not a fight for uh, my sisters. It's not a fight for the gentlemen. It's a fight for all of us. And the, the, the sooner we embrace it and take it as a battle against a vice that affects all of us, the better for East Africa, the better for the, better for the legal spaces where we and some so many other young lawyers work this is something that goes to the quality of the work we deliver. You will never have a young lawyer deliver quality work under those circumstances. So we need to really work on it. And as East Africa, it's the mandate of each one of us. I once again thank our listeners who have joined this webinar, uh, my able panelists, and the able moderator, Tanzu uh, Elizabeth Musikali. Thank you so much. I look forward to hearing from you, seeing you again. I know you're going to be having a virtual engagement. Hopefully one day to be physical, but it was nice being in this webinar with you. Thank you so much. Councilor is back to you.
Right, yes, we're going to Miss Were and then we finish off with Miss uh, Asajile. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, I think my parting shot will be one, where are you going to work? I think sometimes um, out of this variation, we, we just say, we know what we'll do this, we'll do this, but I think um, look out for the red flags in an employer. Um, you, you might want to check what are their policies, what do they stand for, and what is their reputation. Um, I think number two will be speak up whenever you, you, you find yourself in such a situation. Right. Um, and, and as my colleague has said, you have agency. You can always say whenever you're not comfortable with certain acts um, from, from your colleagues or maybe from your seniors. Number three, I would say get help. As I have said, um, therapy really helps, right? Um, talk to someone about what is going on so that it doesn't overwhelm you. Yeah. And the last one, and, and as I keep saying, as a matter of last resort, you don't have to die in a workplace, you don't have to solve their problems. You have to change their policies, get out if you can, right? If you can apply somewhere else where you're likely to get a better um, working conditions, that will be better for you. And lastly, just to thank um, the, the society for organizing this forum. And thank you, Liz, for moderating the forum as well. It has been a pleasure. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm not different from Immaculate and Harvard. It, it really begins with individuals. Before it gets into an organizational culture, it begins with you, it begins with me to kind of carefully assess ourselves. We might be the bullies, we might be the harassers. So like carefully assess ourselves, how our attitudes towards our coworkers if you're in the management, how is your attitude towards your employees? It's just like do a careful uh, self-assessment. But then also let's make this a, a habit, not just talk about it. The way we have, um, our habit was talking about the way we have Monday meetings. Make it like a five minute mandatory. Every, every maybe like first week of the month, every Monday, first week of the month, we have a sexual harassment and, uh, and bullying seminar and let people speak out and know what is going on and if you're an employer you really need to put your ear on the ground because most of the times these things happen around you and you might not see them so just being keen and just being open to listening what when things are happening because at the end of the day it affects your reputation as a firm so it might just be one case and then it might cost your whole business that you worked so hard to uh to grow so be there like understand what is going on and let's not live in a denial and all our preempted biases that we have let's leave them at home first and let's come in our workplaces where we respect each other give each other the courtesy of knowing that this is not a this is not a place where uh, you have any sort of like control over a, a person we work together you, you know you not not just like uh, especially with bullying, bullying happens a lot, uh, and and sometimes uh, because we are desperate, like Immaculate said, you just you just handle it, you 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 keep silent, and at the end of the day, like we said uh, before, your mental health is far way more important than your job. So I agree with Immaculate. If it's time to go, go, because it might be too late before you leave. And then um, for us who are bystanders, please, if we see something, let's say, let's not be just, you know, like you can see a junior, uh, a junior lawyer being harassed and you're there and you are probably, you've been there more. So if you say something, you're more likely to be listened to. So let's use our influence and our knowledge and our power to help others who probably are not able to speak for themselves or are afraid to speak for themselves. So if we see something, let us all say something. And I just want to challenge everyone right now, if you're in a firm, just go ask, do we have a policy? Go and check that policy. Now that you know how a good policy should be, now that you have the tools, go and check it again and then make that change for your own organization before we start going out there. Thank you, and thank you for, uh, for, uh, for the session. It's really it's good to see that we are talking about this now. It's really good to see this. 
Yes, uh, thank you all very much for that. Thank you for the tips on conquering sexual abuse and harassment in the workplace. Again, to all our listeners, remember to take care of yourselves first and even to um, ensure or even talk about the enforcement of a sexual harassment policy within your workplaces. Now, I'd like to um, introduce our vice chair, the vice chair of the Young Lawyers um, Committee, Ms. Agatha Ninsima. Uh, to give a vote of thanks as we conclude. Again, thank you to all the panelists. Over to you, Agatha. Elizabeth and the panel for um, a very insightful, a very insightful uh, conversation that um, we've just had. Um, I like the words um, of of one of the panelists, as she said, if you see something, say something. And um, if we are going to deal with sexual harassment in the workplace, really, it will take all of us to say something once we see something happening. Um, on behalf of the young lawyers uh, that have been lis listening into this webinar, uh, and on my own behalf, I would like to extend um, my heartfelt gratitude and appreciation to um, our panelists for this enlightening and uh, thought-provoking um, discussion on sexual harassment uh, in the workplace. And um, I believe the insights and uh, the comparisons between jurisdictions has given us, uh, has shed light on the nature of sexual harassment in the different countries and also um, has shed light on the need for commitment for each one of us to raise awareness as well as uh, to promote the prevention of sexual harassment in our different workplaces. So uh, I, I, I want to say that this is the right step in the, in the right direction. And if we are to address this critical topic, um, we need to be empowered as individuals, uh, but also as, employees and employers in the different places that we serve. And um, we are very grateful for uh, the panelists' dedication to prepare effectively for uh, today's session. And uh, we pray and, and, and believe that if we continue shedding light and having such conversations, then we shall be able to eradicate sexual harassment in all its forms, as mentioned, in the different um, workplaces that we, that we uh, work at. Thank you once again, Elizabeth, for your wonderful moderation. And for all the people that joined today, thank you so much. Please continue to join the Young Lawyers um, webinars. We have a lot uh, of um, informative and insightful webinars prepared. And also, please attend the annual law conference. Um, the, that is happening in Bujumbura. Please, please, young lawyers, we hope to be there in large numbers and we are encouraging each one of you to please come. There's a lot that will be shared come uh, Bujumbura. Thank you so much and have a nice evening. Right, thank you all. I think I can pass it on to the um, society. Thank you everyone for attending today. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Elizabeth and uh, our esteemed uh, panelists. We are indeed are grateful for all the effort that you've put into making this uh, session possible. To our participants, we'd like to thank you uh, so much. We'll share a recording uh, of this session with you or via email, and uh, we'll also issue out certificates of attendance and for the moderate, uh, for our we we'll use certificates of appreciation, which our IT team will have delivered to your emails. As mentioned by the vice chair, please uh, do not miss out on Bujumbura on the 22nd of November to 25th of November. 
please show up in large numbers. We are planning as secretariat to uh, discuss modalities of uh, easing transportation to uh, Bujumbura. So kindly reserve your slot by paying up uh, for the conference. And uh, to know more information, please uh, reach us at events at elosociety.org or reach us at uh, info at elosociety.org. Also, we do have uh, feeding contracts training in Mombasa uh, at the end of this month. So 28th to 29th of, uh, of, of, of September, please uh, do not miss out on the feeding contracts training. If you're interested in construction law and, uh, and feeding contracts in itself, uh, please do not miss on this session, it's accredited and uh, you'll get a certificate of attendance uh, register. And in case you need more information, please uh, reach out to us at infatelosociety.org. We'll be able to answer all your queries, but from us to you, thank you so much for being part of this session. We look forward to uh, hosting in subsequent sessions and you have yourselves a very lovely evening. Thank you so much. <laughs>